Hello and welcome to Unparliamentary Language, a podcast that wants to be absolutely clear about this. You must stay alert, control the virus and save lives. From this Wednesday, we'll be encouraging unlimited downloads of our podcast and over the next few weeks and months, we will keep an eye on the data and we may be able to go further. We will shortly be giving out detailed guidance on how to ensure all of your podcasts are kept two metres apart. And how are you, Rob? I'm very well. I'm better for hearing that. <laughs> it was very good. Sorry. I, when you write the joke, I can't help myself but laughing at the one at the start. Um, I, I never laugh at my <laughs> own joke. Fine. And how are you? Yeah, uh, I'm all right. Um, I mean, obviously getting on with, with work and life uh, in lockdown, as I think everyone is. Um, baked a cake. You know, I, th- I think that's what a lot of people are doing. We haven't got Bake Off to look forward to, so let's have our own Bake Off at home. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I made a chocolate orange drizzle cake yesterday, which was lovely and still is lovely. Got several slices left. That's so lovely. Just, yeah, you'll have to post me over some. I don't know how it works anymore. <laughs> I've just stayed inside this house for the last <laughs> two months. So food comes in through the door somehow. So I, I, I assume that that'll work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there is a way to magically deliver cake to people. I, I suppose without further ado, let's dive into the big story, uh, which is I mean, it's still coronavirus. Uh, this used to be the Brexit podcast. Now it's very much the coronavirus podcast, but not, you know, the officially branded BBC one. So um, talk us through the weirdness of this weekend, uh, Rob, starting with Friday, which was in a weird turn of events, a bank holiday that was not Easter or Christmas. Yeah, that felt really weird. Um, it was, um, that was VE Day, was, was that was VE Day on Friday? I'm trying to think. Yes, uh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that day where we celebrate the fact that we defeated fascism and nationalism in Europe by being unreasonably nationalistic. <laughs> yeah, by waving big flags everywhere. It was, yeah. it was a really like it's odd sensation f- for me. Like you know, on a personal level, I didn't get involved in any celebrations. But then again, our, we live on a main road, so it's hard for people to set out, you know, bunting and have street parties without being mown down by oncoming traffic. So. Mm. Um, that was a bit different, but the whole, it, it seemed to be like a well-needed release valve for the country who had all been, like I said, shut away for the last two months. Um, any excuse for a party, really. And people came out in their droves to celebrate. Um, a lot of people did so responsibly, um, but there were also quite a number of pictures on social media and um, one worryingly where there was an actual BBC reporter in front of an entire street of people who were out and about and looked like they were nowhere near social distancing enough. Yeah, I, I think that is the problem. I, there was this whole kind of talk, and we'll get onto this more as we move on, but there's this kind of talk of, oh, well, the lockdown's going to be eased this weekend and all this back and forth. And then people are like, oh, it's a sunny day and it's, it's a time to get out and about. And, and, and uh, you know, and I think, I think that's the problem is some people were like, oh, well, it's, it's basically over. Let's get outside. And uh, yeah, that's probably not the best idea considering we're seeing that uh, I think I saw reports today that in Wuhan there is another outbreak. So, yeah, probably not the good idea to list, lift all the lockdown straight away. No, precisely. Um, and there's even there's an there's an article that I've I've dropped in our our show notes um, that was just one from somebody in Wales saying that uh, it was a rather frustrated Facebook post from an A and E worker who said, "Oh, it looks like you can't catch COVID nineteen on VE Day." from the amount of people that we've seen today. it was They said it was like their A&E was full of people, like it was a regular Saturday night, like mostly alcohol-related or head injury type things. And it just seemed to be that there were a lot of people acting irresponsibly or more irresponsibly than they had been in the past two weeks. Um, mm. And that A&E worker in particular said that they expected a another local peak there in another 10 to 12 days. And that's the other cruel thing about this virus is you don't know the impact of something until about a week, two weeks down the line to see if it's actually yeah. working. So I guess we'll have to wait and see if the V celebrations have had any impact on the overall numbers. Um, certainly from the, the picture shown on social media, there was, there was one, I tried to find it to put in the show notes, but I couldn't, it was, uh, they said, uh, please observe this, um, this picture and as everybody like doing the conga uh, for VE celebrations. And it said, the second, please explain why the second peak um, was worse than the first peak. Um, yeah. That's a <laughs> GCSE history question from 2049. Um, yeah, it's just, is a bit bizarre. Everything's bizarre in the situation, but suddenly seeing so many people acting so blasé in the situation was a little odd, maybe a little worrying for how we're going to do going on. Because as we're going to say you know, later in the podcast, this lockdown, or at least the stages of it, is, is far from over and we're going to need a lot more 
diligence from the general public if we're going to get through this without another major second spike. We'll we'll get to that in a bit as well as we talk about uh, government messaging, but it's very much a um, it very much seems like it's being left up to the public to be sensible, and uh, there are some examples here of where that has not been the case. So I think the thing we want to move on to, uh, talking about, as I was saying, that the newspapers may have may have intimated potentially the possibility of a lockdown um, being uh, slightly loosened. Um, uh, or possibly they went even further than that. Is that not the case? Yeah. So on Thursday, just before VE Day, um, one of the big headlines was from The Sun and it just said, Happy Monday. And it was said, basically said that, oh, lockdown restrictions are set to be released on Monday. We'll be a lot freer. You know, this is great. We, we've done our bit uh, only for another Murdoch paper on Friday to put out a message, which was PM to keep Britain in lockdown until June, which is obviously a very different message. That's an, in, you know, an entire month. Um, it appeared to be that there'd been some leak within the government or some of their communication strategy had got muddled because, you know, it, it won't be a surprise to anyone that, you know, the government will have its way of getting its stories into the papers. Um, and The Sun is unlikely to have published that story without thinking it would be true. Um, I know this is The Sun we're talking about and people who have read The Sun and their corrections and clarifications page um, may have <laughs> something to say about that. Um, but yeah, it... That feeling, particularly on Thursday, maybe it was before VE Day and people who'd read that thought, oh, fantastic, it's loosening up on Monday anyway, why don't we go and have a big booze up? Um, but yeah, they, they appeared to jump the gun when in fact, you know, Boris's speech, which we're going to move on to on Sunday, um, appeared far more sobering, um, if in some respects lacking any major clarification, which I think is the big thing we want to we want to talk about today. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, so maybe we should have a look at the slogans before and after his speech before we analyse things a bit more in depth. Mm -hmm. So our original slogan, very clear and concise, I'd like to think, was stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. And I think that's, that's, that's some very good messaging, some good government copywriters there making a very strong message that basically stay at home, uh, do your best not to go outside, et cetera, et cetera, as we've all been doing for these last, well, it must be at least a month and a bit now. Um, it's hard to think that we went into our hovels in March and we're still here in May. Um, April has disappeared in a poof of uh, isolation. Um, so that has now been changed to stay alert and control the virus. So um, yeah, change to stay alert and control the virus, which I, I don't know about you, but um, how am I supposed to stay alert? Am I supposed to stop sleeping? Should I be <laughs> entirely full of coffee all the time? Um, and how am I going to be alert to this invisible thing that is affecting us? Because, uh, yeah, like, <laughs> I can't see it. You can't see it. Do we all have to go around with electron scanning microscopes? Um, and control the virus. What with? A large net? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think it's a very clear slogan. And I think uh, they have been rightfully... Uh, taking the mick out of for the last uh, day or so uh, about this. Um, but maybe you want to make some more points. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a real failure in government communication at a time when we need communication to be at its very clearest. It's, it's very clearest. People are looking to the government for guidance and to have these two sort of very vague sentences that add up to save lives. It's like the old meme of like, step one, do X, step two, do X, question mark, question mark, profit. You know, like, I'm not quite sure how one and two really lead to three. And they need a lot more filling in the gap. So we, we talked about that first one, which was stay at home, protect the NHS, stay at li save lives. Obviously, there was a lot more to that in the government scheme of things. Stay at home unless you're an essential worker, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's more caveats. So that, that first phrase, you know, you're never going to be able to show the whole picture with just a snappy phrase. But this second one really... I think it raises more questions, as you've quite rightly pointed out, that you know, than it than it answers. Um, I just wanted to point out one reason, maybe why it had changed. Um, this was brought up. This was brought up by somebody on Twitter. I've, I've forgotten the name of who it was, um, but they pointed to this article on May the first, which is this statistician from Cambridge University said that the original slogan "Stay at home, protect the NHS, stay save lives" was 
too effective. In particular, that first bit, stay at home, where he said that it's made people too anxious to get out of doors and back to living normal life. You essentially want people to get out and start living again to some degree if we're going to, you know, ease other concerns, you know, that we have about how the economy is going, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a bit of a, I find that response a little bit hard to take. It's like the person mm. in the job interview who say, you know, when you ask what's their greatest weakness, they reply, I'm too much of a perfectionist. You know, what's the problem with the original slogan? It was too effective. I, I think we've been too clear with our messaging and we do need to make it a bit more fuzzy around the edges. And moving on to the, you know, to the new one, the stay alert, control the virus. Um, Boris Johnson did try to clarify on Twitter yesterday what stay alert meant. Um, and it sort of includes five things, which is stay at home as much as possible. Work from home if you can. Limit contact with other people. Keep your distance if you go out and wash your hands regularly, which I might turn around and say, how is that different to what I'm doing now how do what everybody's mm. doing now um so i think that you know even having a look at his twitter profile now it says boris johnson hashtag stay alert so the government is clearly trying to get <laughs> all everybody. in on this <laughs> yeah yeah they're trying to get everybody on message um and we'll come to boris's speech um later but i believe he repeats that three word slogan like two or three times throughout he is he is really trying to rally at home but it's one that has caused widespread um you know, consternation. Uh, some people have pointed about the, like the the subtle nudge in other changes that they've made to the slogan. So the original one was in red and yellow, and this one is in green and yellow. Red traditionally, mm. psychologically, means stop. Green mean green means go. So does that mean you know? Oh, we're lifting the lockdown uh, a little bit. I've even heard others say that this, um, stay alert, control the virus part is a way of shifting responsibility from the government having responsibility for how the the, uh, the virus is controlled onto the public to kind of say, so the government can kind of turn around at one point and say, hey, it's not our fault that infections have risen. You all needed to be a bit more sensible. Um, you know, we told you everything. Um, that might be a little bit cynical, uh, but it is, you know, it might be a response to the way that the government has taken an awful lot of flack about the way it has handled um, COVID-19 at the moment. Uh, in the past two weeks since we've aired a podcast, we've had um, you know the UK overtaking Italy briefly, didn't it, in the number of COVID-19 related deaths in the country. Um, and we've also had various government, you know, we've had uh, testing figures that have been disputed. We'll go on a bit more about that later. But, you know, the, the 100 tests a day has something that the government hasn't been able to keep up consistently. Uh, so, Maybe they are looking to look for other people to take responsibility for controlling the virus other than them. Um, yeah. It has been suggested by several other podcasts I've been listening to that possibly the original messaging, as you say, was too strong in that uh, people are, you know, people are possibly too, uh, don't get me worried, don't get me wrong here, that you should be reasonably worried about virus. Uh, and we should continue to do so, and we should continue to maintain social distancing. But it's definitely the case that, you know, anecdotally, based on my own experience, that I spent basically two weeks at home without going outside because I was told I should stay indoors. Um, and then when you go out again and you're like, oh, well, we're queuing for the shops. And yes, it's a bit weird, but you're like, oh, there's actually a lot of people out and about. And you, you in your head, you think it's 28 days later and there's no one out there. And that is not the case. There are people out and about doing their, you know, daily exercise and things like that. So I, th I think there is, if, if you're someone who is not vulnerable and, ha and has had to isolate, if you're someone who can go out, going out and doing those daily things, as was originally suggested, is a good thing to do just to kind of keep, your, keep you in that good headspace. You know, I, I, I don't know what sets other people off, but there, there are definitely people who may suffer from mental health issues where, you know, being out and about and, and being able to see people is good. And obviously they can't see people. Like you can't go hug someone, but if you can be two meters away from someone and like have a quick chat with them or something, you know, I've I've heard all sorts of things about people like saying, oh well, you know, come along to my house and there'll be a glass of wine at the end of the street, that kind of thing. So you could like chat, but socially distant. And people are kind of adapting in these ways. And I think, yeah, I, I think there is it is possible with this messaging to kind of go, oh well, you know, we're we're not leaving our houses uh, for the next how many years, and it it it's not that that it's not that way. Um, 
most businesses have now adapted in certain ways. Like if you've gone out to the supermarkets and stuff, you'll see they've got these big barriers up. They're encouraging people to use scanners, you shop apps and things like that. And thing, things have changed, yes, but it is possible, you know, to go out. Like going outside will not give you the virus immediately. That's not how it works. And I think there's definitely an issue where some people have taken that messaging on board and kind of internalized it a bit too much. And I can see why that argument would be made. And Professor David Spiegelhalter is always on uh, more or less behind the stats, you know, explaining these things in more depth. Um, but the upshot of that is you de- isn't you should you know completely roll back to this kind of really mixed messages. And there's some interesting stuff I think we'll get to when we talk about the speech. But like for example, they're talking about reopening gardening centres. Like, are they essential? You know, th- th- there's these kind of questions. I mean, I know know some people who work in garden centres, and they're saying. Well, I mean, it very much seems like we're going back to, you know, do do this, you know, it doesn't seem like it's sensible for us to go back and do this. And, yeah. as a, you know, how is it going to be safe? And also lots of old people go to garden centres. So is the, you know, there, there's a question there. Is the government trying to appease the older voters who are conservative voters? Or have they just not thought through the ramifications of getting a load of vulnerable people in one place, given the current situation? So I think there's a lot of stuff that people are rightfully picking holes in. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and one of the things this has highlighted is the different messaging between England, Scotland and Wales and the impact devolution has had um, in a political sense. Um, it is only England that is changing their message and going away from the stay at home. Both Scotland and Wales are keeping the stay at home mantra Um and I've even picked up that you know Nicola Sturgeon said, "I don't know what stay alert means." Um, mm. When she was talking about the new slogan, and even tweeted herself, she just tweeted the old one out: "Stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives." Um, it's a massive way of showing how uh, devolution has had a big impact on the way that we run our country. Um, we probably never thought it would have had an impact when it came to you know something like this. Um, but the fact you could be living on the border. Um, you know, oh, is it? Is it? You know, do I just cross over the street and then I can ex- exercise for an unlimited amount of time and then pop back? Um, there was even a news story today that basically Wales was telling people not to cross the Severn Bridge into Wales to do exercise and then pop back because they didn't want that happening. Because um, Wales sees that as a threat. Now, one of the factors um, why Scotland and Wales might be taking a different tack is because their R rate is higher than England. Um, I believe theirs mm. is still above one and we probably for those of you who don't know r is the the rate of infection um the you know the amount that the virus spreads to other people so i think originally covid-19 is about like it was an extraordinarily infectious disease it usually spreads to like 3.2 people i hope i'm not yeah that the, number, the, the number was the number was not um so, so i mean I, I don't think we'll know the exact hmm. kind of original r rate for some time like uh, people go through the numbers but I think it ranged between about three and four. So that puts it much lower than, say, measles, which is measles has an R rate of 15. It's really infectious. That's why we have a vaccine for it. And that's why you should get max vaccinated against measles. Um, and then other things have a lower R rate. And obviously, if we get the R rate below one, and that's the important thing here. So at an R rate of one, every person who is infected will infect one other person. And that means slowly... That that means like the number of infected people won't won't change; it, it stays static. So you want it under one because that means every one person infects less than one person, and eventually it goes away, um, and you you are able to solve the issue. So whereas if it goes above one, uh, there's some really good charts. Maybe I can throw them in the show notes showing like if you have a thousand people, at showing you the based on the different R values, how many people will be infected within a week, um. Because obviously, if the R value is like 1.5 and everyone's infecting 1.5 people, you start to get this runaway effect. Uh, because as everyone is infecting more people, uh, then those people go and infect more people. And it's, it's a runaway, it's exponential. Um, so that's why you've seen a lot of log plots of graphs, because that's how you make an exponential easier to read. But I think that often means people have misunderstood the data that's being presented, because, you know, an exponential graph. Uh, the log of an exponential graph is basically a straight line. So it looks, oh, it's a straight line. It's going up, but it's not the worst. <laughs> no, that's exponential. That's like doubling every two days, um, which is not good. That's fine. I'll just rant about maths for a bit. 
No, no, it's it's good. It, it just had it's terrible. You can cut this bit out, maybe, but it just reminded me of you know that bit. Have you seen Chernobyl? You seen the series Chernobyl? Yes. yes. When they're all saying like, "Oh, it's only so many rondims," you know, that's 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 it's not great, but it's not bad. Um, and then yeah. somebody who knows what they're talking about comes in and says, "Oh no, that's actually very bad." And then they find out the real figure, and it's like, "Oh dear, yeah, everyone <laughs> that's catastrophic." Died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Precisely. Um, I feel like everybody everybody's dead, them. Dave. Yes, <laughs> he's doing that at the moment. So, so yeah. So relating to those those R rates and how they're going, that might be why Scotland and Wales are taking a different tack to the rest of of, of England. Um, or it might be a more political factor. We 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 know that the SNP obviously doesn't get on very well with Boris Boris Johnson's Conservative Party and Wales. Um, I believe the devolved administration there um, is controlled by a mixture of Labour and Plaid Cymru. So, yeah, the, the, politically maybe mm. it's not the soundest decision to follow. You know the Boris administration. You know the, the, the Boris Johnson Conservative administration's advice. Um, maybe particularly when you know that administration is coming under fire so much for potential missteps that they've had with handling the crisis so far. So uh, yeah, it's just a, it's an interesting like little proxy war that's happening, you know, politically between the, you know, in the, in the slogan, um, that's the serious bit. Uh, the less serious bit is of course that um, it's created an awful lot of memes. Um, this oh, so many memes. So many. Memes. <laughs> I was just going to say that as a as a formatter, uh, the only thing that distresses me is that it's really hard to get the font right. There's like an official government font, and nobody is using it in their memes, or very few people are. And I just wish they would. But the ones that have come up are, yeah, pr- you know, pretty funny. That's what we need at this time. Quite a good summary of the various types of memes that are out there. Um, the vast majority of them I've seen are actually on this format of the stay alert, control the virus, save lives. It's as you said. Which, as you said, is a green and yellow backed uh, image. Yeah, I think my favourite one is meaningless slogan, three word platitude, invoke heroism, which I think is quite good. Um, essentially, you know, the meta, the meta, I'm always there for the meta jokes. Um, and uh, but there's so many in there. Stop trying to make stay alert a thing. It's never going to be a thing. As if it, you know, that's so fetch. Um, and, um, and of course, there's, there's <laughs> always that, those ones which are like a gif. Uh, that you see on Facebook and then you click on them and so they pause and whatever the thing is you click on, oh, that's you. Uh, there's there's one of those where it's like 12 different versions of the uh, Stay Alert one I've seen going around. But there's a lot of uh, a lot in there in that post that we'll put in the show notes. Very enjoyable. Oh, and the other one uh, that's important is um, comparing the five levels, which we'll get to in a second from Boris's speech, to uh, the, <laughs> peri- the periometer from, uh, from Nando's. Uh, so it's like saying, mm, yes, we're aiming for lemon and herb or mango and lime. <laughs> we're currently mango and lime, but we're aiming for lemon and herb, which I think is, you know, the kind of understanding that a country that loves cheeky Nando's needs. Uh, certainly, yeah. Um, the, 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 th- the, the three-word slogan, I, for myself, I always think it's like an apocalyptic version of the haiku round from Cards Against Humanity. You know, you've just got yeah. to <laughs> pick three random ones and, and, and stick them together. Um, so with all of this... You know, that slogan was released early on Sunday and confusion abound and the Twitterati jumped on it and memes were being created. So up stepped Boris um, to deliver his speech um, last night, which I believe, well, my wife tried to watch it um, on the iPad and it crashed halfway through, assuming because <laughs> of the, in the amount of people watching it. I know a lot of people were like, right, this is the moment, this is the one mm. you need to watch. You know, you've... You've seen all the government briefings before, but but this is the big one. This is the cup final. So, uh, yeah, I've yeah. highlighted, you know, a few. I've used exactly his words and pulled them out, and then I thought we'd just like discuss them briefly and what we think they mean and what questions they yeah. raise. So let's run through those then. So number one, he said the government had done a good job considering the worst case scenario. Um, and I've heard several metaphors along these lines, but you know, it's like I'm trying to remember any good one right now. But I, I've I've heard a lot of jokes along this line. Um, you know, basically the worst case scenario if we did absolutely nothing, which would have been a bad idea. Um, so yes, we've done better than that because we did something. Um, but yes, uh. yeah, precisely. I mean, his exact words were: "Adopting these measures, we we prevented this country from being engulfed in what could have been a catastrophe." In which the reasonable worst case scenario was half a million fatalities, and when you compare that to the, uh, the number at the moment, which I think is around thirty thousand, um, or was the last time I checked, um, 
you know that that does seem like oh that they, they, they've done a good job um but yes in reality we know that that's slightly different um it's only if they had done nothing um one phrase i see bandied about I, I, mean, I don't think i've heard any stories of any government doing literally zero i know i know we talked a bit about brazil previously um yeah. but I, th- I i think you know you know even trump's done something right <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah precisely yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> So do you want to say something more on that or should I move on? To um, that no, one? I just, the, the only thing I wanted to say is I, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, they, they've done a good job, you know, considering, which is kind of a phrase that's reserved for um, under 16s playing football on the park rather than elected governments. So, you know, I'm just yeah. feeling, <laughs> yeah. We, we, we're Coronavirus to, you know, is a game of two halves. Um, <laughs> we're allowed to demand a little better. Well, yeah. Anyway, yes. Sorry. Um, so then, of course, you've already touched on the fact he kept repeating that famous phrase, we must stay alert, we must continue control... Ah, I can't even say it once, so, you know, <laughs> that's why I'm not Prime Minister. Um, so he, he kept using that repeated phrase, we must stay alert, we must continue to control the virus and save lives. Yeah, this is all just political framing, it's, you know, it, it's speech writing, you, you start off with your premise, um, and then, tell you what, later on, it'll make a comeback, and, you know, it, it, he says that these are the three steps and tries to say, right, and I'm going to explain what those mean. If he does mm. so, is, yeah, uh, up for debate, but we'll, we'll carry on as we go through the speech. Yeah. Um, so then he next uh, moved on to talking about PPE. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, there were any particular plans there to fix the PPE problem, were there? Uh, no, so yeah, he, he he says that you know we must sort out challenges in getting enough PPE to the people who need it, and yes, it is a global problem, but we must fix it. So there's a little bit of deflection there, I feel, just to sort of say yes, I know it's been in the media that we've had trouble. Uh, in particular, there was that shipment from Turkey which was delayed and delayed, and then finally came in, and then I think a week later it was revealed that all of that PPE was de- was uh, determined as unfit for use, so they've had to send it back and order replacement which is you know embarrassing for the government and Mm. increases concerns that they're unable to protect frontline health workers i know a lot of people are concerned about how uh, doctors and nurses are operating in hospitals but i think there's increased concern at the moment about how care workers in particular are protecting both themselves and residents because that's where we're Mm. seeing a lot of cases and, and if covid obviously gets into a care home um that's full of vulnerable people and have quite the effect so it's good to see that he's addressing it, but like you mentioned, there's no particular, uh, there's no plan put in place in that speech. He just feels that he has to at least address it because if he didn't, somebody else, you know, certainly on the opposition benches would. So next up, we've touched on this a bit already. There is now a new COVID alert system, and that's going to be based on this rate of infection or R, as we've described. Um, I know that one of my friends was uh, joking that there's a bit where a slide flashed up here with, with the formula for, for what R is. And it was like, this is very much giving flashbacks to all the STEM students who've had to suddenly uh, do a presentation based on some kind of formula. And they've just been like, there, there it is. There's the formula. Done. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I saw online that it was, did they get the formula wrong or something? It was like the rate of infection plus the number of confirmed cases, which I thought if determines the level and i thought surely it's times or or, or something because if it's yes, plus then, think... then our level should be level nine thousand. <laughs> yeah yeah precisely um yes yes no I, I think there may have i'd have to go check that uh i just saw it like that that joke uh, in passing but yes that uh, doesn't wouldn't surprise me if it was wrong as well um and the other the other thing here was there was a very nice uh graph uh with a man on a bike and various other handy pictograms to show us how this works do you yeah, think that's... you understand it based on that <laughs> no <laughs> no it's really yeah. <laughs> like like you like you mentioned it's like a student has just had to hastily put together a powerpoint presentation and yeah that's the, the graph is going down that's good go on a bike now i guess um yeah. <laughs> so yeah so i think at least you know we've been quite harsh to the government here i think at least this part in particular, when they were describing the scale and the plan, um, it, it seems like a sensible step. You have like a, a you know, like of a terror level threat. You have a DEFCON threat. To have this one where it's like, right, we can pinpoint where we are with the virus, 
and what steps we have to take and basing it on the rate of infection seems like a sensible way to manage mm. that. I feel like you said, if it's above one, then the virus is spreading and we risk going into five, which I believe that was the highest level, which is when we, the NHS has the potential of being overwhelmed and that's when you'd need the Nightingale hospitals, etc. There, there is a kind of double-edged sword here though. So uh, on one side, uh, so, so the, the rate of infection takes a little while to calculate because it's based on that kind of we have that delay on the data as we see because of how infections work so in that initial phase where everyone was getting infected and there were no controls r goes up and we don't really know what's happening until five to ten days later yeah um so we obviously in that situation that's bad in some ways this is good on in the inverse as we're trying to come out of it because you know we've got to saying oh well ours ours around one now um that has taken that, that 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 means that's what the R was hopefully like at least five days ago. So hopefully in that meantime there's been a bit of a drop as well. But obviously the problem is you still have to be very careful because if it starts to rise again, you're actually five days behind um, at least. So and then people so, will say you've acted too slowly to this. Yes. Yeah. So so it, it is a bit of a knife edge there. But no, I mean I, I do I do believe that following you know the the data and the scientific advice is the right way to do this. Um, and I was actually happy to, you know, I'm happy that it wasn't just like, oh, lockdown's over or, you know, or, or even something a bit more nuanced than that. Like, I feel the messaging here has not been as clear as it could have been. But the fact that they're not saying, oh, everyone's back to work to tomorrow was good. So, you know, there is, there is it, it, it's not all bad news. Um, uh, I think there is some, some sense being played here, but it's also kind of, it is understandably hard to message. Uh, but you know I, I think there are things we can reasonably criticize speaking of things we can reasonably criticize um so government set itself a testing uh, target of 100,000 tests a day and then didn't do it and then fudged the numbers a bit so uh <laughs> what did he say on that yeah so um in particular in the speech he said um if we were able to control this virus then we must have a world beating system for testing potential victims and for tracing their contacts so that all told we are testing literally hundreds of thousands of people every day um which is probably the big like warning sign that's the thing that suddenly raised my eyebrows a little and went hmm that figure is widely disputed and i don't think you can reasonably say that you're doing that because that was a target that they said they would reach 100,000 tests per day by the end of April. They managed it on the last day, um, including some figures for tests that hadn't come back yet or ones that had sent from people It was from tests that were in the post, I believe. Um, yeah. Or they were being delivered to hospitals, but they hadn't necessarily been used, so that doesn't really count, does it? No. Um, <laughs> and then for the 11 days after that, I think every day since then, the government has failed to meet that 100,000 test a day target. Now, there's been other discussion about this, you know, how how meaningful is this target? You know, is this number mm. just plucked out of the area? Are we right to obsess about this number and the government not hitting it? Is it just used by people to bash the government instead of actually worry about what, you know, what testing is? Um, you, know, you know, how effective the testing is and how that can be used to uh, help us exit lockdown. So, so then the next point as... As we said, uh, was the confusing message about who should and shouldn't stay at home. Yeah, so this is where so Boris talked. Well, he was talking to di directly to camera to the whole thing, but a bit where everybody's ears sort of perked up. He said, "Now I need to stress that anyone who can't work from home, for instance, those in construction or manufacturing, should actively be encouraged to go to work." So here you have people saying, "Oh, okay, I wasn't allowed to work before. Now I can." Um, but is that, you know, what work does that apply? Who in the construction industry? Um, am I expected to go back to work and not socially distance? Is that safe? That's the thing that's raised an awful lot of questions um, to, the, <laughs> to the degree that um, there's a cartoonist in the Telegraph called Matt, um, who I enjoy his cartoons quite a bit. Uh, I believe his one today was two people sat at home saying, right, we can meet our parents if we set up a construction company and hire them as workers. That's the only way um, we can meet up with our extended family. Uh, <laughs> I hadn't even thought. Of that. <laughs> which is like these, these weird loopholes and people are now, that's the thing, everybody, you know, to have that turned around, is that 
him saying that on a Sunday evening, does that lead to construction company bosses on Monday morning or Sunday evening themselves ringing up workers saying, right, everyone back to work on this project when they haven't had time to prepare sufficiently safe social distancing measures? That was the, I think that was the biggest bombshell of this entire um, mm. press conference and one of them which led people to say, A, what? Um, and we need <laughs> an awful lot more clarity on that point. Clarity, clarity would be good, wouldn't it? Um, the next one, uh, which I, I think one thing I'll, I'll add one thing onto this point we've got here. So okay. unlimited exercise. I mean, so that sounds good. But we, we joked before about how all these people who previously had never done an ounce of exercise in their life were suddenly going for 20 mile runs or doing the marathon um, <laughs> because they're only allowed one piece of exercise a day. Um, but I mean, realistically, yeah, I mean, you might have had to leave the house more than once uh, in the day. So most people were trying to combine like their walk with going to the shop. Um, maybe that meant people went to the shop slightly more often than they should have done. Um, but in general, I think people were quite conscious of that. Uh, one point you've made here, I think, is that it's trying to get rid of these petty fines for people who, you know, oh, I've seen you at the house twice, you should get fined. But on the flip side, he did mention that fines will be increased uh, where fines are actually in force. Which seemed fairly sensible to me. I think that was him trying to lay down a, 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 you know, a line in the sand, wasn't it? To say, we are easing it, but still abide by our laws, or you know, we're not going to turn a blind eye to things anymore. Um, I think this whole statement where he says, you know, that from this Wednesday, we encourage people to take more and even unlimited amounts of outdoor exercise is, it's nice. Um, but it's pretty token in the grand scheme of things. As you mentioned, people were kind of doing it anyway, and a lot of people were mm. probably doing it and getting away with it as well. Um, you know, that there aren't police, comb at least I'm not aware that police are combing the street where I am and having people, you know, yeah, brought up, you know, rung up for having two jogs instead of just one. Um, it's a nice measure, um, and I guess you do need to give everybody a little bit of carrot when there's an awful lot of stick in this uh, in this speech. Uh, and it was certainly a point that I saw grabbing some headlines with people trying to spin it as, oh, hooray, th these, these are good things that are happening, and was probably one of the only clear things that you could take out of the speech. I thought that, you know, oh, unlimited exercise, that's a bullet point that I can put down and say, yes, I understand completely what this means. Uh, but yeah, in the in the grand scheme of things, it's a relatively minor change to what our existing lockdown procedures are so so the next point uh is so we talked about timescales earlier um the earliest release of this is going to be in june um and that's going to be in schools you may have more to add on this uh but uh the idea being that um we will get primary school children back into schools and also i think he said something along the lines of those kids who have exams next year, we would like them to see their teachers before the summer holidays, um, but didn't give a firm date. Um, so yeah, that's an actual date, June the 1st, after half term, trying to get some, some kids back into school. Yeah, it's you know fairly significant. And I think the reason that they are targeting certain grades of kids is you know important. I think like the, they mentioned year one and year six, year six, they'll be moving into a different school next year to, to have that last bit of contact with their primary school teacher and to have the, you know, that, that knowledge that what state they're going to be in when they enter a new school. That's super important. Also for year one, that's getting children used to the idea of formal education. I know that there's reception before then, but uh, to use, to borrow my wife's phrase, that's basically um, wiping kids' noses and you know their asses as well, just to make sure that you can't. <laughs> it's more of a it's more of a crash than it is a learning mm. institution. Um, year one, they're a bit more with it, so have to you know get that done. So, I think that was you know it's nice to have a timetable there. Um, and the limited years back um, clearly shows the challenge that social distancing will have within a school environment. Um, there's no way that you keep kids two meters apart with the size of classrooms, etc. You know. It, as they are now, um, how a teacher is going to socially distance from kids as well, who may have a slightly, you know, I think particularly maybe, you know, in a primary school, they'll have a less, um, they might be less aware of social distancing or how to follow those guidelines. Um, what I'm trying to say is I saw a video of a kid just licking a railing 
um they don't care <laughs> yeah. they'll wipe their noses on anything they don't care you know like there's certain things that it's harder for them to follow than responsible adults uh, so you'll need fewer of them in there but you might need the same amount of teachers in there to try and keep that level of control over the class I don't want to name names here in case uh, they don't want this public, but I have a teacher friend who has posted uh, what the BBC teach schedule should be in the lead up to the 1st of June. Uh, They pointed out that there should be multiple maths classes explaining what does two metres mean um, and that there should be creative writing to describe an imaginary small child who never goes near another child. Um, (laughs) They also wrote up a mock GCSE question about how how big a classroom is, how many children there are in the school, how many new classrooms will need to be built by the 1st of June to allow this to happen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think they're rightfully being uh, kind of taken to task over that. Um, but, it, they're, they're again, talking about the difficulties here, there is this kind of, it's not so much of a knife edge here, but this is more of a, you know, lots of people have to stay home to look after their kids who, or, you know, people are not able to work as well from home looking after their kids. So, It was always the fact that they would want to try and get some kids back into school as soon as possible to help alleviate that. But also we know that kids, like part of the problem was kids essentially could pick it up and pass it on, we thought. Uh, So, you know, that they could go in, get infected, come home, get everyone else at home infected. So so there is that problem there. So it's it's, it's hard. Um, This is one where I don't think I'm in a good position to make have a strong opinion i'm not a teacher and i'm also not a parent um and and i think yeah it's going to be hard and they're not going to there's no way they were going to please everyone with what they did with the school schools coming back definitely um so next point a new normal which is the phrase i keep seeing i even read a a brief scientific paper well let me retract that um, the, the new normal is uh, next on the list. Uh, I've even seen um, some, some opinion in various uh, medical journals about this using that phrase. Uh, I think it's one of those phrases that doesn't sound great, but like Brexit is going to be with us for some time. So the new normal will be by July at the earliest. Yeah, so I think this is Boris setting out a very long term plan saying, look, we can't have things go exactly the way that they, you know, that they used to be even if our R rate is very low, and I think we, we go into that stage five. Um, he pointed out that, you know, subject to the, all these conditions and further scientific advice, and only if the numbers support it, we will reopen at least some of the hospitality industry and other public places, provided that they are safe and enforce social distancing. Um, so again, that's saying, look, we will you know, we might get to have sport again. We might get to have, you might be able to go to the pub again, but you know, you might be able to go to restaurants, but be aware, you'll have to stay two metres apart. You'll have to abide by these rules and try and socially distance and only go there and we'll only open them again if they're safe. So essentially, that is the new normal, to use that phrase, um, until a vaccine can be found, it appears. Uh, mm. I think that's his way of trying to warn the public that this is, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. And even if things seem very, you know, even if the risk appears low and the data backs that up, we still have to be vigilant. Maybe we still have to stay alert to control the virus. <laughs> so so here is a point where I think it's interesting. Like, there's not enough information here necessarily to... Like, we know eventually we're going to have to start letting people go back to work and, and so on, um, and doing so with social distancing until there's a vaccine. So that's fine. We understand that. That's what this concept of the new normal is. Um, but I think the the point that a lot of people will be asking here is, so yeah, may- maybe you're a restaurant that has a large veranda, a lot of outside space where people can sit uh, socially distanced in family groups. Um, maybe you can't cover as many tables as usual, but maybe you could do well because there will be a lot of people who want to come back uh, and get get out and about after this time of lockdown. But is there any talk there, any detail on whether there'll be loans or extra support? Because a lot of you know a lot of pubs have to ram people in to to survive with their rents and everything so i don't think there has been any guidance published yet on how they're going to support all these businesses who are going to be presumably bringing their employees out of furlough and etc um to open but won't actually be earning the amount of money they used to so yeah well what's going to happen there would be my question yeah precisely and i think it's the question that everybody's got isn't it really it's just we don't know and 
I think in all honesty, the government probably doesn't know at this stage. Yes. No, I mean, I mean, I, I can understand that, but, but I think that's the big question is how is that going to work for all these businesses that might, you know, if you were breaking even with a full pub, how are you going to do with a half full pub? I think there were a few interviews when furloughing started with the, on the coronavirus podcast with various publicans about how, um, how would this work and, and other things. Um, and our final point is this airline quarantine, which I believe is 14 days if you've flown into the country. Uh, yes, I believe that's the number that's been touted about, but isn't official anywhere. And even when I was reading articles earlier, they said that their government hadn't decided definitively on a number of days. Um, this is like, I think, good news, sensible news to have it in, mm. but it is a bit like bolting the stable door after the horse has bolted. Um, yes. A lot of people will say, why didn't you do this? Before, when you knew cases were coming in from China, etc., you know, I'm not talking months and months and before, months and months before um mm. but other countries such as like i think singapore had had put that in very early and their number of cases have been extremely low i mean there's a lot of other factors why their cases were were low um but they've been able to react to the virus very well so this is again it's good news to see that that's something that they will that they'll do like you say 14 days is the figure i've been seen banded around and that would seem to make sense because that's in line with um, the guidance if somebody in your household is infected, then you know it's seven days to isolate and another seven days on top of that uh and problems yeah. as I can foresee um what about the eurostar <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yep good point um or or ferries i mean i don't know if you've been on a ferry, but they're normally quite busy mm, um yes I, I suppose the idea is that there's less people traveling et cetera but but and and there definitely is a special problem with air, airline travel because a it allows you to get between two places much faster and the air is recycled um, while you're on board so the chances of you catching something are much higher even if you're not sat next to someone. Um, but yeah, it does it does seem a bit weird that it's one form of travel. I mean, fingers crossed they get their, their act sorted out. Um, I know that Boris is live. I think as we record, answering questions um, to try and clarify all of these matters. And I know it was. Uh, Dominic Raab and Matt Hancock's unfortunate pleasure to go on Radio 4 and all the other broadcasting services to try and clarify these issues. Um, the thing that struck me is 24 hours after these you know, points have come out, a lot of the case we're still no clearer on where we stand with a lot of them. And that's, yeah. that's a bit worrying. I know advice trickles out and you know, it comes in on Wednesday and I'm not working in an office at the moment, but I've got people who are going into work at the moment who are because they work for an NHS IT department and they've been forced to take their own action. So they are enforcing social distancing within an office environment. So I imagine that a lot of companies are working um, on that premise now and you know have had plans ready to go for a while, but without strict government guidance. Um, mm. Some people will be upset if they are called back into work and don't feel safe to do so. Um, yeah, that, that, that's the big thing. People have got to feel feel safe in order to go back to work. Uh, and I'm not sure if the government guidelines currently um, give me much reassurance that be that will be followed. But I hope they do. I hope they get their act sorted out soon. Yeah, this is not quite the new normal, but as we said, thing, things are being slackened slightly, um, and it's all a bit confusing. Um, I hopefully I will be able to put a link to a summary of what's currently being said by Boris right now into the show notes so that there is a bit more clarity on some of these points. But it does seem a bit a bit bungled uh, would be my overall summary. Um, like you can see in a lot of places where they're coming from, but they haven't necessarily explained it clearly. And we know that that's really important with these things. So, yeah. So before we go to our quick polls update, uh, here is a quick advert for another show on the network. Hi, have you ever wondered what would happen if you took the schoolyard conversation of which one of my favourite fictional characters would win in a fight? Well, wonder no more. Join me, Chris, and my co-host Matt every other Sunday for Mishmash Mayhem, and you can find out. So I believe we're going to go into our quick polls update uh, and looking at the uh, generic ballot again over in the US because we're not having an election anytime soon. Um, looking at the last uh, week or so, well, all the all of the ones in May, um, it's lo still looking strongly in favour of Democrats. Uh, 
trying to see what the minimum distance is here. And I think it is 5% is the, the minimum distance. That's from a that's from one of the less good polls. Uh, but if you look at the better polls, you're looking at up to 10% lead for the Democrats at the moment. Um, so yeah, uh, I think this is echoing what we've seen before, isn't it? Yeah, precisely. I don't know if you can change it to the president general polls. So how Biden versus Trump is doing at the moment. Uh, oh, it's president the, general election. Yep, yeah. Yep. So um, if uh, you go to, go to May wow. 6th. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes. I've just seen what you mean. So uh, to be clear, on May 5th, uh, the Ipsos Mori poll put Biden ahead by only, pl- only one point. Um, but when you look at uh, the one from Emerson College, as you say, on May 6th, Biden on plus 34%. That's that's impressive. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if I truly believe that, but that is coming from one of the the higher ranked um, uh, higher ranked polling companies there. Yeah, I, I I mean, I don't believe it. Anything that predicts a it's 34 a small point, sum, sorry. Yeah. Y- yes, um, but still, uh, I think maybe the, the the striking thing here is that Biden is ahead, but it's close. And boy, did we hear that before in. Uh, I, I don't think this is, you know, I, I don't think the Democrats should be uh, celebrating too early here, as we've seen before. But I, I know that a lot of Democrats I've been speaking to have been very uh, upset and downtrodden recently because, you know, a, a lot of them were supporters of non-Biden candidates um, who obviously didn't make their way through. And now they're kind of picking through the fact that Biden is their candidate and there are various uh, concerns that he's not. You know he's not the best. There's there's these um, I mean other than the fact that he's quite old, uh, older than Trump, I believe. Uh, which obviously you know you could say, well, why why are we still voting for one old white guy? And also you know will he be, you know, but but it, this always happens when there's an older candidate. But you know people look at the speeches and say, oh, are we sure that you know his old age isn't getting to him, etc. Which is not great. Uh, and then of course uh, in addition to that, there's um, the accusations of um sexual harassment that are ongoing um and the democrats seem to have kind of brushed those under the rug when i think there is a reasonable point here to be made that uh they didn't let this slide for um ca- uh, some some republican candidates uh, such as uh my brain's on blank the supreme court justice oh kavanaugh kavanaugh so yes well, the, the, there, there was definitely an argument that the kind of rhetoric that was being used by the democrats when kavanaugh was up um but for for the uh, Supreme Court, you should always believe someone who comes forward with one of these accusations, um, and and you know then thoroughly investigate it. And then it seems like when it's on the other foot, maybe they're they're not doing that, which obviously doesn't sit right with a lot of Democratic voters. It, it it's definitely I, I would point people to better sources than myself on this. Um, <clears throat> there's Left, Right, and Center, the podcast um, from KCRW that's really good, and they have had several uh, good discussions back and forth on this point. Um, um, I feel like Biden is, you know, he's not far away from having one big scandal or something that makes him lose the next election in the same way Clinton was put in that position last time round. So as you say, I think these numbers look good now, but I don't think the Democrats can sit on their laurels um, and, and, and hope that this means they will win. They need to put some work in. And if there is a scandal, like Trump is the kind of person where a a scandal tends to brush off him, even with the current ongoing situation with the coronavirus, um, which will, in fact, we'll get to those numbers in a minute once you've put your uh, opinions to me about this. Yeah, um, no, I, I, I agree with everything you, you've said, particularly the, you know, it's when sexual harassment allegations come forward, you should treat them all the same, regardless of political, you know, regardless of your political. That's opinions. a better TLDR than I meant. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it is slightly disturbing that they might be seen to be brushing those under the rug. Um, I think looking at it from another point of view, as in just from a purely political point of view with the with the points and how much he's ahead, um, I know that Biden doesn't have the enthusiasm amongst Democrats, uh, but he does seem to have a more positive feeling amongst um, like more centrists or floating voters um, than Hillary did before. So that might be the one thing that pushes Biden over the line. I know that last time in the last presidential election, both Hillary and Trump were almost hated in equal measure. Um, and that made it very difficult for people who hadn't made mm. up their minds to 
pick a candidate. Uh, maybe in this race, it'll be oh well, it, 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 you know, the, um, if more central central people are edging towards Biden, that might help him if it turns out to be a particularly close race, which I think it, it will do. I, I believe those polls that say Biden is five to three points ahead, rather than the one that says he's thirty four points ahead. Yes. Yes, I mean, that definitely seems more reasonable. You always get some kind of outlier poll. So a rolling average is, is generally the best way to look at these things. Um, so now moving on to something where we do have a good rolling average. Uh, how popular or unpopular is Donald Trump? Um, so his disapproval rating is still above 50%, which I don't think would surprise anyone. But interestingly, there was quite a drop between the end of April and start of May. I'm not 100% sure why that would be. Um, <laughs> So his his approval rating has not changed, really. Mm. It's kind of flat. But his dis- that means there's more people in the middle who are kind of unsure. And I'm not 100% sure what Trump has done in those few days to actually help his ranking in that way. Like, it, seem, it seems as an outsider that he's continuing to, to kind of make blunders and do the wrong thing. But maybe, maybe you have an idea why about a week ago he suddenly had a bit of an improvement in his outlook. I think that it probably dipped very much thanks to the inject yourself with bleach comments. Um, and then things tend to balance out to a normal, like there's a, there's a sharp effect from that. And then people mm. kind of go back to their original opinions slowly and there's, and there's a drift. And one of the things that we've, I think we've said consistently about Trump is that people made up their minds about Trump quite early on. Uh, yeah. And he's very good with keeping his base enthusiastic and those who dislike him continue to dislike him and will never change their minds on him. So that's why I think it's fairly consistent. And I think the fact that we haven't really had another explosive Donald Trump press conference since the bleach moment maybe shows that he's taken a step back from those sorts of things. I know that Mm. he's been, uh, controversially, he's been promoting the theory that the virus was made in a lab in Wuhan, one that is yeah. widely dismissed by you know security experts within his own government, but one he continues to repeat. Um, that will be something that resonates more with his core voters um, as an idea, um, but it's not as mind-bogglingly stupid or evidently wrong as injecting yourself with bleach. So by the very low standards that Trump has set himself, um, he's been able to surpass them slightly that's why i think it's, you know he's had the the drift um has gone you know like mm. he, he hasn't suddenly shot down fairly consistent by just doing trump things just just carrying on so i know one thing that's often been said about trump he has this very solid core set of voters who don't seem to really move um but with those people in the middle it's almost keeping himself in the headlines that's important um and, and so it, he is kind of the proof of the ad, old adage, no, no news is bad news. Um, he, he's always in the news for something. And even when he's walking around a factory that makes masks while live and let die plays, which was, Im, you know, impressively bad optics, the kind of thing they'd write on the thick of it or, or veep. And you'd be like, that would never happen. And, you know, for Trump, that's just another day. It just brushes off his back, uh, which is always impressive. Um, yeah, I, I don't think we have much more to add uh, here. I think we managed to keep it just about under an hour. Um, so um, as always, Rob, thank you for joining me. Uh, you can find us in all the usual places. And as we always say, uh, the two things you can do that help out the podcast the most uh, are either go over to patreon.com forward slash TTSS uh, and give us a few dollars to help support the show. Or of course, uh, spread the word, let people know about this podcast, uh, subscribe to us, all those things. Uh, it's like being a YouTuber, you know, like and subscribe and all that jazz. Uh, but yes, uh, the thing we want is more people listening to us um, and enjoying what we've got to say. So if you like us, tell someone else. And without further ado, I don't think there's anything else to say other than it's good night from me. And it's a good night from him. Bye. 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 Hi, Bart. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You always get me with something. (laughs)